Okay, our skeletal system has multiple and competing functions, and it can adapt to its structure to meet those functions throughout our lifespan. Our bone structure is based on both genetics and the environment and the demands that we place on our skeletal system. For example, if we decide to lay on the couch all summer, we might decrease our bone mass. If we decide to do plyometrics for the whole summer, maybe we'll increase our bone mass or strength. So first, our bone is a tissue that we can feel but not see. So if you touch your elbow, you're touching your ulna. If you touch your knee, that's your patella. You can feel your fibula, which is the bump on the outside of your ankle, and your tibia is the bump on the inside of your ankle. And we can feel that the bone is rigid. It provides structure and scaffolding to our body on which the muscles attach. And between these bones form our joints. So basically, bones are a crucial player in motion, which we'll discuss later on. Bones are also protectors. The scaffolding surrounds our brain um, and shields our heart and lungs from impact. That's our, uh, our ribs. Our pelvis protects our reproductive organs. And our vertebral bones stack up like Legos to protect our spinal cord. These two functions of bone result from its strength and its stiffness. But bones have another main function, which is actually a competing function, in that it is a reservoir for mineral, in particular calcium. Our bones have a lot of calcium. 90% of the calcium is stored there. So if our body needs calcium, it will take it from our bones, which could compromise the bone structure. The final function of our bone is making red blood cells which occurs within the bone marrow of our cancellous bone. So let's look um, more at the functions of our skeletal system. Bone must be strong, but not brittle, right? We need to be able to jump up and down or hit the edge of a table which, without our, our bones shattering, kind of like fine china if you dropped it. So um, to to be able to do that function, bone is a combination material. It's made up of collagen fibers, which are almost like rubber bands, and mineral, or hydroxyapatite, which is really hard. So we get this composite mineral material, which is similar to carbon fiber or reinforced concrete. So you see here we have rebar within the concrete to add bendability to, say, our freeways, especially here on the West Coast. And then we have the concrete that gives it its stiffness. And something similar to a car that has carbon fiber, it's both strong and bendable. Okay, let's look at the architecture or structure of our, our bone. It's not just a matter of the, the, the pieces of the bone or the ingredients of the bone, the collagen and the mineral, but it's how we build that. And we can look at two analogies. One is the famous middle school toothpick bridge. Right? So the material are a bunch of toothpicks. But how you build that structure will dictate its strength. Right? So the above image of the toothpick bridge probably would withstand a lot more load than the image below it. Another way to look at it is you can have a pile of Legos. Legos are Legos are Legos. They're made of the same thing. But how you build or what you build with those Legos will determine the structure or strength of, that, of what you did build. So not only ingredients, but the structure is key to bone. So let's look at the contributors to mechanical strength for bone. First is the mass. How much bone? Right? People with more bone will probably have stronger bones. However, that is not the only key factor. A second key factor is the structure, so the size of the bone or the geometry. You can see here our bones are hollow, and that is a very strong structure, similar to bamboo. And then the third factor that contributes to mechanical strength is the material, the quality of the collagen and the hydroxyapatite. So the ingredients, if you will. So let's look a little deeper and look at clinical measurements of strength. Currently, we use DEXA scans, and we look at BMD. And so in populations, 
in the lay populations, we hear people say if they have high BMD or low BMD, and they're using that, that terminology, bone mineral density, or BMD, as a surrogate for bone strength. And BMD is the amount of matter, or bone, per cubic centimeter of bone. And if you see here, we have a, a DEXA scan, and it's a frontal plane, two-dimensional image. Okay? It misses or doesn't measure the size and the geometry of our bones. So a lot of the strength of our bone comes from the fact that it is hollow and circular. And the wider that, that hollow part of the bone is, the stronger it is. So BMD is missing size and geometry uh, for bone strength. Okay, let's get into types of bones in our skeleton. We have two types of bones. They're made up of the same collagen and mineral. However, the way they are constructed or their architecture is very different. So one is called cortical or compact bone, and that's in the diaphysis of your bone or in the shaft of your long bones. And then we have trabecular, also called cancellus, or even spongy bone, which is at the ends of your bones or in the epiphyses of your bones. And let's look at some images from real bone. We see here you have this thick cortical bone in the shaft of the bone. And if you look at a cross section, it looks very solid and strong. And then up here at the ends of the bones, it also almost looks like a sponge, which is where they get the name spongy bone. So you can see it's, it's very porous, um, very sponge-like, uh, and that is at the ends or at the epiphyses. So that's trabecular, cancellus, or spongy bone at the ends of the bones, cortical bone in the mid shaft. Finally, I just want to review three bone cells. First are osteoclasts, and um, commonly denoted by an OC. These are multinucleated giant cells. These cells eat bone or complete the function of bone resorption. So these big cells, multiple nuclei, go to bone and eat the bone either to fix an injury, say a microfracture, or if your body needs calcium, it will stimulate the osteoclast, and the osteoclast will go to the bone, eat the bone, and free up some of the calcium into the bloodstream. Another cell are osteoblasts, or denoted by OB. These are our bone builders, or the bone formation cells. So osteoclasts eat bone, osteoblasts build bone. And then just for completeness, I wanted to introduce the osteocytes. These are cells that sense how much we exercise. So they live all throughout our bone and they connect to one another by these little canaliculi. Okay? So these are mature osteoblasts that are embedded in bone and are basically our, our sensory system. So finally, let's just look at some um, criteria that would result in high bone mass or on the opposite side, low bone mass. And so we can look at um, osteoblasts versus osteoclasts. And in this graphic, if the cells are blue, that means they're functioning normally. If they're green, they are stimulated. And if they're red, they are suppressed. So here are three scenarios that we could result in high bone mass. If our osteoclasts were ner working normally and we increase the function of our osteoblast, we would build bone. If our osteoblasts were working normally but our osteoclasts were suppressed, we would build bone. Or if our osteoclasts are suppressed and our osteoblasts are stimulated, we would also build bone and result in more bone mass or high bone mass. Conditions that would result in low bone mass would be if your osteoblasts were working normally, but your osteoclasts were stimulated, so more bone loss. If your osteoblasts weren't working well or were suppressed and your osteoclasts were working normally, you would result in low bone mass. 
And if your osteoblasts were suppressed and your osteoclasts were stimulated, then you would also result in a net bone loss or low bone mass. So these are just some introductory features of our bone that should help you with the first questions on the exam.